As you can see, it's, uh, it's difficult traffic out there, so hopefully we'll have a fourth panelist joining us here momentarily. Um, but I, you know, I don't think there's a more uh, timely topic than the interplay between crypto and macro. Uh, clearly, we're coming off of a week where we're seeing uh, elevated uh, currency and fixed income volatility, uh, VIX reaching recent highs. We've got the dollar appreciating versus the basket currencies. Again, multi-decade highs, the pound appreciating. We have the BOJ intervening uh, to strengthen the yen. Um, so clearly, there's a lot going on in the macro world. Uh, and of course, we're all here focused on crypto. So really, the, the discussion today, we want to talk a little bit about the interplay uh, between the two. Um, I'm joined with a, a, a very uh, talented group of speakers. So I'll give them just a moment to introduce themselves. Darius, you want to start? Sure, thank you. Uh, my name is Darius. I'm the founder of QCP Capital. We are a full suite crypto trading desk. So we do anything from spot um, rates, options. Um, we also do quite a bit of uh, venture and PE investments. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll continue. <laughs> I'll give you a second to catch your breath. I'm um, Jody Alexander. I'm the chief, exec uh, chief investment officer of Selena Capital. Uh, we're a trading firm. We do market making and we also do venture uh, as well. Cool. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, good morning. Um, sorry for a bit of a delay. Um, so I am Zahir Eptikar. I'm a portfolio manager at Ledger Prime. Um, I primarily focus on liquid and discretionary trading, and I also focus on venture a bit as well. Um, and generally speaking, Ledger Prime does uh, as a quantitative investment firm, so we also do market making, and then we also do uh, OTC options, uh, similar to Darius from KCP. Awesome. So when, in 2017, when I first started running uh, capital for outside investors, I was pitching a lot of institutions. I was pitching them on you know, what I thought was the value proposition for then largely Bitcoin. Clearly, the universe has expanded a lot. Um, and we talked a lot about other things of you know, censorship and inflation and a lot of things that clearly, at least from a, a US-centric point of view, weren't at the forefront. And then now we fast forward five, six years, and we have you know, single double-digit inflation across several countries. We've seen financial censorship um, in both you know, developed and emerging markets, most recently Tornado Cash. There's you know, uh, Canadian truckers protesting COVID and being censored. So there's a lot of different things that you would think um, would be driving kind of a positive tailwind for crypto. And I think what's on the, the mind of a lot of people is why is you know, you know, crypto price maybe not reflective of that despite you know, the bigger backdrop. So maybe Jordi, if you've had some thoughts on kind of what's driving <laughs> crypto prices now as it, as it relates to what otherwise seems like a pretty strong macro narrative. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everything has been trading with a correlation of one across risk assets, whether it's equities, whether it's cryptos, um, all of them. And it is, you know, a lot of us uh, in crypto try to bunch everything together, but there are like different use cases. And I think one of the things that's changed since the last cycle is uh, the use of stable coins to start to take advantage of, you know, uh, being able to transfer money abroad. Um, being able to have access to something apart from the local currency. So people will just expand the euro dollar system by buying USDC, buying USDT. And that's a way for somebody like in a developing country to get access to um, an inflation hedge. So instead of them using Bitcoin or you know, Ethereum or something else, they're using stable coins. So the narrative has to kind of shift and we have to determine like what exactly are the different use cases that we're looking at. Obviously, right now, with the currency crises across the world, where the dollar, I don't know how many of you believe the dollar milkshake theory or are familiar with it. Obviously, that theory is potentially playing out where there seems to be like a lack of dollars um, across the world right now. And potentially, stable coins are taking a little bit of a fire. Um, and instead of people trading Bitcoin, they're trading the other part of the pair. So it's Bitcoin slash USDC. So when you say, why is the price going down? Partly because USD is becoming more popular. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk a bit more about some of the drivers of decoupling um, as we as we get into the the panel. I guess from like a, a flow perspective, I know you guys both do some market making. Um, in terms of of your own shops or allocators that you work with, the counterparties you work with, what are you guys seeing from a, a flow perspective, and how are people in the market positioning themselves again with this broader macro backdrop? Do I start? Do you start? Hey, you can come. <laughs> Maybe from a. Uh... B bigger picture perspective, if you look at all assets this year, year to date, uh, everything is down except US dollars, natural gas, and some pockets of real estate. Maybe the so, ruble. Sorry? Maybe the ruble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So actually, if you look at it, um, there has been no clear inflation hedge. Everything is down. You know, um, so uh, not not fair to say that you know Bitcoin is a. I mean, it was meant to be an inflation hedge, but this is a, a, an environment where, because of high inflation, um, there is policy uncertainty, and every asset is reacting to that, right? reacting to the potential drain of liquidity. Uh, so the strange situation is that actually, even though the market is pricing in a big drain of liquidity, there is a lot of dollar liquidity still. So you know, especially in crypto, because uh, you know a lot of the as crypto assets like Bitcoin, Ether, you know, were sold down. To the, so long into dollars, and, and you have a situation where crypto lending deposit rates are lower than treasury, treasury yields, right? So you have a situation where the market is pricing in a lot of policy uncertainty, everything is being sold down, and uh, you know, Bitcoin, Ether, crypto is not spared in, in, this, in this respect. And then at the same time, you have a lot of liquidity. So um, what we are seeing on the flow side is while the VIX is pricing in highs, I think last night it hit 34, uh, crypto vaults have actually been coming down. Right, so pricing in sideways or, or you know, pricing the liquidity flush. Uh, so we have a bit of dislocations in the market. Uh, could be opportunities there, um, but you know, I think interesting to see how it goes. Yeah, I was going to comment also on skew in general. So uh, short dated skew. So this is um, you know basically the delta between uh, a call and a put um, for us options guys um, has been relatively high historically for for ETH and Bitcoin this summer. Um, and that also shows a lot of positioning, in my opinion. Um, and then also funding rates generally for um, kind of more exotic products uh, have been a little bit more expensive. Um, but I think I wanted to touch on what Darius mentioned, which was, you know, even the most safe vanilla investment, which is U.S. government bonds have been down 20 something percent this year. So this is one of the first times in history you see both equities, which are deemed risk assets, and then also, you know, very safe government bonds trading well in, you know, negative uh, throughout the year. So, you know, it's really hard for any asset class, let alone, you know, crypto, which is deemed like maybe furthest out on the risk curve to, you know, catch any sort of bid in this kind of chaotic market. Um, and then there's also the fact that I think uh, markets are always forward looking. Um, it's not random that when inflation became a very uh, mainstream co topic of conversation that, you know, Bitcoin and Ether prices peaked. Um, but it was the expectation that inflation would happen, that people went for these risk assets. And this is the same thing for Amazon or Twilio or whatever other uh, public equities exist out there. Right. Yeah, so that, that um, concept that assets are forward, you know, forward looking, which I totally buy into. Uh, markets being efficient, I'm not sure that I buy into, but um, that's clearly a, a, a leading thesis. I, th I think one thing you hear a lot is, is that crypto is the last efficient market. And I think what people mean by that is that it's not as subject to manipulation, at least in a structural way, as a lot of traditional markets. And again, that's also debatable itself. But the fact that it trades on regulated and unregulated exchanges, it's generally accessible to everyone. That's actually structurally very different than equity markets, definitely different than the treasury market. And so do you, do you see any evidence of crypto actually leading you know, a potential policy change? Like right now, we're on the back of you know, Fed funds rates, I think, expected to be 4.5 by the end of the year, 4.7 in the beginning of next year, dollar appreciation, this risk of breaking things. Is there any, um, and, and in the last week, we've we actually seen a bit of decoupling between crypto and, and traditional markets. Um, you know, you mentioned the VIX, you mentioned, again, relative strength versus NDX, all that's been quite strong. I'm wondering, is that the crypto expressing, hey, like, the Fed's going to have to pull back, or there's going to be some other kind of policy shifts, or is that more just a, a short-term anomaly that I'm buying into too much? and being, you know, hopeful about? <laughs> no, I, I think that's a good question, right? And it, there's no easy answer to that one. But, you know, when... Um, so there, there are two parts to this. So when, when, when Russia invaded Ukraine, right, uh, what we saw was an increased interest in... You know, if you look at all the uh, DeFi participation, we saw increased interest from the Russians mm -hmm. and the Chinese, for obvious reasons, right? Uh, that crypto is still the only non-sovereign capital market. Um, but at the same time, so, so to answer your question, you know, there, there is this potential that as a non-sovereign capital market, it benefits in a multipolar world. Uh, it benefits in a world that, uh, you know, where, where, where uh, US economic hegemony is, is being decayed. Um, but at the same time, it is, a, it is increasingly becoming a more speculative asset for both institutionals and retail. And for that reason, it gets very sensitive to policy changes as well. 
So you have this, these two forces that are, that are playing at each other. Uh, remains to be seen which, which wins out in the end. Uh, but correlations have been high. I think the, the, the decoupling has only been like a two days, so I don't think it's that significant. I, don't, I, I, I expect correlations to remain high, and increasingly so, because at, at least for the next year, because uh, you know, um, crypto has become one of the macro risk assets. Uh, maybe a higher beta, sometimes lower beta, depending on, on which, but you know, I, I expect it to increasingly become a macro risk asset. So we haven't seen the, uh, you know, we saw signs of this decoupling in terms of the interest, uh, but we haven't seen evidence of that yet in the price. Yeah, yeah I think if you look back um, at March 2020, so this is the period when we had the COVID crash, um, you know, when no amount of monetary policy at the time could really reverse course for, for equity markets. But um, there's an interesting kind of lag between uh, crypto markets and equity markets at the time. So crypto actually bottomed about 10 or 15 days before equity markets bottomed. Um, and you can make a similar argument that maybe it's not 10 or 15 days this time, but maybe a couple of months, um, mostly because crypto doesn't have any backstopping capability. Now there's some exchanges that are willing to backstop a lot of the carnage that exists, but um, especially back in March 2020, there was no backstopping mechanism. It, when you liquidate, you liquidate on market and you market sell the order. Um, so there's no means for there to be a perfect match and there's no delay in terms of margin call. So that leads to a lot of carnage very quickly. And this is why you've seen crypto seem somewhat resilient uh, in the face of you know, equity market carnage, um, mostly because we've already had our period of time. You know, we've already had our, uh, you know, most, most of our liquidations went through in a month and a half, two months. Um, you don't remove $40 billion worth of excess uh, without hurting the broader market, but there's not pockets of $40 billion of vulnerabilities within crypto every single day, right? So you don't have Luna, Luna implosions every other day right. in crypto. You know, and I hope so, at least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, coming from traditional markets, which are so much bigger than crypto, I never imagined that crypto would be like a leading indicator. But what I've seen over the last few years, because of crypto being such a pure liquidity asset, it does lead both on the way up and on the way down. And I think it will bounce back first. It's also crashed first. We don't know exactly how long the difference between crypto and equity markets is. I think it's expanding. I think crypto is a lot closer to um, bottoming right now than uh, equity markets, partly because of the deleveraging that's already happened. Um, and I think crypto is really the source of, like, it's like li liquidity sink. As money will re-enter the system, a lot of it will look for where is the most return going to come from. People look at risk return and they'll say, you know, here's all the asset classes. If I'm actually optimistic, if I think the markets are going to be doing well for the next few years, where do I allocate? And crypto has a very strong kind of potential for, you know, at, at this point, having already had a very strong bull market, I think people will look at the risk reward in a good liquidity environment as being very strong for crypto. Yeah. So it's interesting you say that because I, like I, so, so clearly I view crypto as being kind of out the risk curve, but I, I also hate kind of like compartmentalizing it as this like the most speculative asset, which I feel kind of demeans some of the, the long-term utility. And clearly we're on this, you know, evolution of, of um, you know, maturation, right? Like there's a lot of promise, but we're still kind of developing all the use cases and primitives. What you know, where do you think we are in that timeline? What do you think needs to happen to see decoupling? I mean, part of it, we're saying maybe we already are decoupling a little bit, and that's more of a liquidity discussion. From a, a like utility and adoption discussion, what do we need to see, you know, to, to have a broader decoupling? And maybe we can, de we can break this into Bitcoin as its own, you know, asset, and then the rest of the space, which clearly is also an oversimplification, but I think the narratives driving them are different. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about decoupling per se, but um, I mean, just from our end, from the trading side, what, what we've seen is that, you know, uh, so I used to be an FX options trader, right? And we've seen the same guys who were trading FX options, a lot of them are now trading crypto. I think Azaya will agree with me. So uh, I'm not sure about decoupling, but I think it's been very, it's, we're, we're moving into an era where Bitcoin specifically, and maybe Ether and, and maybe some of the bigger layer ones are starting to be seen as um, legitimate macro, macro markets. It's no longer a frontier or emerging thing, yeah. right? Um, 
I mean, just to give you an example, you know, I think last month in August, I think at least a third, a third of the uh, Ether option trading volume came from a single hedge fund, right? Yeah. And these are big established hedge funds coming into the space. So we're starting to see that kind of liquidity point, uh, starting to see that kind of interest point. Um, whether it decouples or not, not sure, but we will definitely see better infrastructure uh, and, and the way it's, it's going to be traded in, in a more sophisticated manner, right? Yeah. You're going to have, you're not going to, you're going to, right now you have, I mean, the credit markets have exploded. You know, that, that, that's, that's going to take some time to rebuild, but the vol markets are being more, becoming more sophisticated. Um, you know, the, 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 the curves are getting interesting and a lot more better priced. So I think we see this institutionalization happening. Not sure, again, not sure whether it becomes decoupling, but uh, it becomes an institutional asset and then, you know, the whole crypto space uh, sort of trades around that, so to speak. Yeah, I think the number one driver of any both innovation and also capital introduction will be regulation. Um, and not regulation in the sense that we need to go ahead and ban crypto assets, but rather um, people are unsure of what they're unsure about today, uh, which is a huge problem for any sort of institutional investor, but also uh, for any mainstream pockets of capital. Um, if the only headlines that we see for crypto are Luna implosion and a certain hedge fund uh, defrauding investors, then that's a humongous problem. Um, so you, we need to change that narrative for one, you know, number one. And then number two, it's also um, working with regulators very, very closely. And I hope the MAS in the room can, you know, hopefully uh, work towards that goal of, you know, having a very robust, very clear um, regulatory framework. And I think that was, you know, what will get us to the maturation of the asset class. Because today it's still very much, you know, high net worth retail that, that has been around for a number of years, and you're seeing the, the trickling in of the institutional asset class, uh, as Darius mentioned, but it's not, you're not getting BlackRock buying Bitcoin on the open market, right? Um, and hopefully that feature ends up happening. Actually, on, on this point, sorry, on this point, I, I, think, I think that, you know, we've had a credit crisis in crypto, right? So my thought is that, you know, for the credit market to be built up uh, in a proper manner, not the way that we had it before. Uh, I'm thinking, I'm not sure whether you guys agree and happy to hear your views on this, but I'm thinking that the banks actually need to be involved. So to, to Zahir's point on regulations, right? The banks need to be involved. Uh, we need to have a, a proper overnight rate, a proper interest rate curve uh, for the credit market to, to, to begin again. Because what we had before was poor foundations on the credit market and then guys being able to borrow $10 billion without any credit rating. Um, and then, you know, that imploded. And, and then you have a huge deleveraging in the space, and right now, you know, the credit market is broken. So I'm not sure what you guys think about, you know, um, how do we rebuild this credit market? And, and, and to Zahir's point, whether we need the banks to be involved, whether we need the industry guys to be involved. Um, I can answer that. I, I do have quite a different balance of um, importance. I think getting the credit back into crypto is not necessarily the key thing right now, because credit is very good when you need to expand the supply. You know, of course, like the moon boys want credit, so you, you know, we can 10x leverage and like create these big bubbles. But I think in terms of what's important is the narrative, the crypto narrative. So what we've had is a lot of questions around, you know, what is, what is the benefit of DeFi? What is the benefit of like this technology? And, you know, everybody here is obviously like interested in this technology. That's why we're at these conferences. But we have to kind of think about the broader adoption and the broader world. People on the street, they're not necessarily seeing what we're seeing, and they have to, like, they have to kind of be brought in, either without realizing it. So there can be like a lifestyle app or like a FIFA you know, World Cup thing, and they don't realize they're actually interacting with an NFT or crypto. They're just kind of doing it for fun. So that's something that potentially can bring a lot of people in. But I think what's really important is not just using this market for building, you know, they say bear markets are for building. Cool, we have a lot of developers now. There's a lot of hacker houses, there's a lot of people building. We have 800 DEXs, we have like 50 centralized exchanges, we have all this stuff that people are building. How about like bear market is for like philosophy? Let's come up with like, you know, what are we actually using this technology for? Where does it fit in? And let's kind of collectively use like the mind space for coming up with that. And we see even like the really, you know, I'll call out like even like the, one of the best funds in the space, Paradigm. Like, you know, these guys are, uh, you know, very well regarded and I regard them very highly as well. But even they will kind of use cop outs like, you know, crypto is a great alternative currency. 
it's such a broad thing. Like, what does crypto mean? Do you mean Luna Classic? Like, wh what exactly yeah. is currency that you're talking about? Because most of these things are speculative assets. And nobody's really doing the hard work of, you know, okay, we have 800 cryptos. Which ones are fitting different use cases? We can just say that it's great alternative currency, but somebody has to kind of give a clear picture, especially to the outside world. Because we talk about gaming, gamers, Right now, if you look at the reaction to Web3 type of games, it's very negative from the Web2 side. Maybe it's just resistance, maybe it'll change, but I think the narrative has to kind of shape and form the reality of the broader world. Yeah. No, it's, so we touched on a lot of topics across those, <laughs> those three answers. Um, I, I do think, at least to, to date, there's a lot of crypto as like a, a solution looking for a problem, at least in some respects. If, you, if you're in the weeds because you're just building a bunch of different you know, a bunch of different DEXs, a bunch of different lending protocols, which I think are, are useful primitives that will get adoption in the future, but that seems to be kind of part, <laughs> part of what is. But another thing we touched on, so there's, there's kind of banking buy-in, and I think that's important from just not having a, a um, combative relationship with regulators and with the state, and so that's helpful for adoption. I think what you mentioned, having use cases that I think, frankly, aren't DeFi or aren't alternative money are a good track for getting adoption. So... I, I don't think there's going to be a congressional testimony around, you know, in-game assets and NFTs, or at least I don't expect that, not to the same degree that we see with, you know, dollar-backed stable coins. And so that's kind of a Trojan horse for, you know, adoption in, in, in the future. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of different <laughs> <laughs> spectrum of, of, of use cases there. Um, I, I think maybe one thing we should, we should touch on, because you talked about, you know, senior engine, what is money. I, I think one use case that we kind of all take for granted, but is now becoming more relevant, again, is, is stable coins in general. Um, again, it seems kind of boring if you're in crypto because we've been talking about it forever. We've talked about Tether forever. USDC is not particularly sexy. UST might have been until, you know, it, it imploded. Too sexy. Yeah, too sexy. <laughs> um, but, you know, but the reality is there's, I don't call it 150 billion-ish in, in dollar-backed stable coins. Um, in this current environment, this is the first time we're going to go into you know, uh, an era where you potentially have a, a currency crisis and you have access to dollars outside of your banking system, which is a, a, a huge deal. And again, I don't think it's as much, you know, press or, or notice. Well, I, I think it's an extremely important topic, right? Uh, the, the stablecoin layer is almost like the pseudo banking layer in crypto. Uh, you know, you get a fiat in and then it's, it's, where, it's where the liquidity sort of collects and, and it creates stability in the space as well. So uh, it, it's, it's a boring topic until it depacks and then it becomes less boring. Yeah. So, uh, so, so I think, you know, I, I used to have um, this quarterly call with like, the Fed, right? Uh, and and my, my pitch to them, I can't, I can't tell you what they say to me, but I can tell you what I say to them. My, my, my pitch to them is always that, and, and to a point that we discussed earlier, that USDT is actually very important for, for stability in the space. Yeah. So, you know, they should not be targeting them, they should be working with them to sort of build the stability. And more importantly, it actually increases dollar dominance and it serves, it serves their purpose as well. I mean, they're afraid of the uh, depegging that, that creates uh, instability. But, you know, insofar as they're able to mitigate that risk, you know, all the stable coins are, are very, very important in this respect in creating liquidity in the whole space, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, like you said, a bit of a boring topic, but, you know, it, it's, it's, it's good that it's boring, you know, uh, when there's nothing to talk about and, and everything is stable. I think we should go on that thread a little bit more because, uh, again, it seems like the U.S. and regulators are relatively antagonistic to stable coins. On the flip side, right, the, the U.S. has benefited from the petrodollar for, you know, I guess 40s, 50s, you know, onward. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a backlash against that, right? You have, you know, oil being denominated in renminbi and, um, you know, bilateral contracts between Russia and Saudi Arabia on this, like, explicit point to get away from <laughs> the dollar and being you know, explicitly being able to avoid sanctions. On the other hand, the most common <laughs> stable coin, again, is dollar-backed. And if you're in countries, you know, that are, are dealing with hyperinflation, I think the first step we've seen is not go to Bitcoin immediately. It's like, how do I get dollars? And now there's, there's a route for that. Um, so, so from my perspective, it's actually like the government should be <laughs> proponing U.S. dollar stable coins. You know, again, not that... Well, I, I always had this theory that, you know, uh, that... that um in the life of Tether, like maybe in 2018, 19, when Tether was a bit unstable, I always had this theory that the, the, the Fed was actually bidding Tether. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it makes sense, right? I mean, if, if, if it destabilizes and, and like 
China and Asia use a lot of, of, of tether. Uh, so I, I always had this theory that they were the ones stabilizing it, but it was never confirmed. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I think going back to the topic of you know, what's considered sexy in crypto, um, I think f as you get along the curve of people who've had experience in crypto, stable coins are like a, top, a favorite topic of everyone just because of how much, how amazing they are truly as an innovation um, for, for the world as a whole. I mean, the ability for me to send, um, you know, $100,000 without having to do infinite KYC uh, is such a blessing. Um, if I try to do that with the bank, it's like, four or five days of paperwork, verification, in-person um, you know, meetings, things like that. And then they question you about your own money. Um, so stablecoins really solve that problem. Um, and I mentioned this on a podcast with Mark Yusko too. It's just stablecoins are the best thing for the US government. Yeah. Um, so they should definitely be a huge proponent of this. Um, but I think, you know, what does that expansion of, of stablecoins look like? And what does that mean for our market today? If you look at the total crypto market cap, um, Today, we're at you know, a little bit over a trillion dollars, or maybe a little bit under a trillion dollars, actually. Um, stable coins make up 15 to 16% of our entire market cap. This is a substantial difference than you know, even at peak in 2020, when it was around 4% when crypto prices were depressed. Um, so you're getting more and more liquidity into this market, and you're getting more liquidity both in terms of people being able to transact in dollars, but also people having access to dollars. So now you know, exchanges are becoming this amazing place for people that are, live in non-American countries to get access to fiat cash um, and protect against, you know, 20 to 30 percent currency swings, which is a humongous blessing for anyone. Um, there's been a lot of conversation about this on Twitter as well, um, where, you know, the average retail trader can now, you know, if they have their money in the Korean won, it's down 20 percent on the year. You have cash now because you have a USDC market. Um, that is an amazing, amazing innovation. And I think it doesn't get enough love. And that expansion is probably one of the best ways for crypto to grow. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, to touch to the broader point about the dollar, obviously, stable coins is good for the US dollar. And we're in a very interesting situation right now in the macro you know, history where the US dollar is potentially going to start having a lot of pushback from other countries which we're kind of seeing signs of that, of course, initially from China and then Russia, who are just kind of saying, we don't necessarily want a country to just be able to print as much of the reserve currency that everybody then has to like go and beg them for. And a lot of the global powers are gonna potentially start getting into the digital realm, like we've seen potentially with CBDCs, where they start deciding that there's a battleground on digital fiat and they wanna fight the US on that battleground, it's gonna be easier for them to fight on this new battleground, the digital battleground, rather than the traditional fiat battleground. And I think the next few years, we'll see things that are very different from the last, you know, post Bretton Woods years. The dollar is potentially gonna have a lot of sentiment against it from other countries. For example, right now, they just gave away like $10,000 in the US to anybody who has a student loan. Meanwhile, you know, Europe, the Euro is getting devalued. If you follow the dots, what's happening is pensioners who are trying to save euros for their retirement are paying for Johnny to get a huma humanities degree, you know, at some like crappy college in the US. And that, you know, Spanish population will eventually catch on, for example, and say like, we don't necessarily want to be funding dollar strength and just kind of letting them print that money. And I think the battleground will happen on the digital side yeah. and with CBDCs potentially playing a large role, and hopefully also a kind of more libertarian asset that is more retail. Um, so I hope Bitcoin potentially can play that role. You know, people in Bitcoin world are like waiting for the institutions. When are the institutions gonna put it on their balance sheet? Actually, I think let the institutions play their CBDC game, and let's just have kind of a global community of retail users have an alternative to that. So there's, again, a lot of things to unpack. So there's a lot of innovation going around stable coins, which I think is, you know, a huge, and this is everything from what I would say is vanilla and kind of boring, like USDC and fully backed, and then you have the spectrum of, again, USD, <laughs> UST, which was you know, not backed at all, but, you know, highly, highly liquid and at least not censorable, and then you have the spectrum in between, so you have you know, fracks and cello dollars and like, you know, the entire spectrum. So I think that's kind of one driver of adoption and innovation. Um, and then you, you made some interesting points on, on you know, who's going to push back. So who's going to push back on, you know, the dollar and the dollar dominance. So 
I kind of view crypto as like a release valve for global markets, and it's something that people opt into because it aligns with their you know, incentives. And so I, I'm curious on this like, idea that I think governments will push back on dollar stable coins, but at the end of the day, since they're going on rails that are permissionless, it's really up to whoever, like, <laughs> the people are going to choose what currency they want to hold. So is that first dollars, and then, then people become skeptical of the US government and say, hey, we want to move to something like Bitcoin, or like, how do we, how do we see that play out? And then let's, let's, let's use that as kind of our, our jumping point to like, what's our, our, our kind of outlook over the next six, 12 months as it relates to, to crypto and, and Bitcoin? Maybe uh, touching your point on, on the usage of dollars, right? I mean, there, there's always uh, a lot of talks about these CBDCs and local, local currency stable coins uh, uh, and, and the prolifer proliferation of that in terms of remittance and stuff. But actually, practically speaking, and in the last five years, you know, whenever we, we, we've done, because uh, we're in Southeast Asia, so we, we facilitate a lot of crypto-based uh, uh, movements cross-border. The irony is that the main usage is the US dollar stablecoin. So USDC, uh, you know, BUSD, PAX, and, and, and USDT. Because uh, how, how it works in terms of cross-border movements is there's domestic transfer. So let's say if, if somebody wants to send money from Indonesia to China, right? Typically, you go to the money changer and you, you switch your, your IDR to the CMY and you do a remittance. And the way that the US dollar uh, helps that, uh, USDC or, or, or stablecoins help that is they do a domestic transfer from IDR to US dollar, and then they move the US dollar digitally, which takes five, five minutes max and, and no cost, and then they change it to CMY there. So what happens is actually is re reducing the need for, the digitalization of, of, of dollars actually reduces the need for any local currency stablecoin. Because essentially, locally, most currencies are already digital. So like in Singapore, you have fast transfer, you know, it's easy, right? right? Um, so actually, this, uh, the, the digitization of currency actually increases the use case for US dollars. So I think that Practically speaking, uh, it actually reduces all the need for CBDCs. CBDCs become only for settlement on for local local uh, local settlements and local uh, securities and, and such. But the cross border becomes very very dollar based, which is what we are seeing now. Yeah. So uh, I think mean, as to your point, as you know, the, whether you know how, how the US dollar stable coins play in this in this uh, respect, a lot of it has become more dollar based than anything. Yeah. 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 Um, 150 billion dollars is no trivial sum of cash. Um, even for the largest money markets in the world. So um, I think whatever window of opportunity uh, regulators might have had to clamp down on it, now it becomes a humongous collateral damage uh, you know, impact. So it's like you can't remove that liquidity or say, hey, we're going to remove USDT from circulation because now there's hundreds of thousands, millions of users who depend on that USDT. So now it's much more of a game of collaboration, in my opinion. Um, I think in terms of, you know, can this eventually, you know, does this hurt the Bitcoin narrative or does this hurt the ETH narrative? Um, I don't think so. I think it's just a duration thing. Um, so right now, uh, one of the major reasons why stablecoin proliferation happened in the last two years um, is mostly because of the yield that could exist um, both on chain and also through uh, centralized lending. Um, so you could get, you know, almost double digit uh, you know, uh, lending rates by giving out your USDC or USDT, um, both to centralized exchanges and then also to, um, you know, DeFi protocols. So obviously this is a very attractive, um, you know, overall yield for people to go after. But the interesting thing has been since yields have compressed and now there's also been a convergence of yields between very vanilla US government bonds and also the compression of, of uh, you know, DeFi yields and also the added smart contract uh, risk that exists. Even amidst all of this you know, difficulty, uh, stablecoin supply has only you know, dropped maybe 10 to 15%. Yeah. Um, so it shows us more and more that both this cash is here to stay in the long run, um, hopefully. <laughs> um, and then also that you know, this cash is not just here for yield, but also theoretically here to have dry powder to buy crypto or to you know, basically facilitate um, you know, transactions or to, you know, or for people to just currency hedge. Um, so there's more than just one reason, one basket for why these stable coins exist and why there's so much value behind them. And I think in the long run, this ends up coming back into, uh, you know, that, that release valve of global liquidity, which is, it goes into ETH, it goes into Bitcoin, it goes into Solana, um, because that is where, you know, these dollars have the highest velocity. I mean, I think one thing that's underplayed is the power of community around a certain asset. We've seen that in crypto many times, like with Luna, with other assets where like the community will just kind of 
decide to store a lot of like their work in a certain asset. And like in Southeast Asia, as you know, India, other places as well, historically, like for many years, gold has been used uh, for that. Like people just pass on gold chains to like the next generation or they, you know, they give them at weddings. And then that's kind of like been used for a long time. I think, you know, a lot of people thought gold was going to do very well right now compared to the US dollar. They thought that, you know, this was the perfect environment for gold. And you see a lot of the macro people trying to figure out like, why is gold um, basically flat? It's being a stable coin. It's another stable coin. It's the, <laughs> the gold stable coin. And um, they, they try to come up with ideas and they say like, well, maybe because, you know, central banks are, they're keeping it down or whatever. I think the reality is gold is becoming outdated and that's what the older generation that maybe was very attached to gold hasn't really given up yet. No. All the new people and the millennials who are starting to, uh, you know, get some of the wealth as it's kind of passed on are not necessarily going to want gold. They're going to want something digital that fits in with their lifestyle because people are not walking up and doing trade with coins anymore. Everything's happening online. And just having a, a vault in Fort Knox, even if you make a, a coin that's like a, you know, we've seen some people try to make gold backed, uh, you know, pack sauce or, or something like that. That hasn't taken off because ultimately, like, who wants their gold stored by a third government somewhere where, you know, you don't actually have custody. And if you do have custody, you have to go around giving people coins. Nobody wants that. So I think gold is going to slowly kind of dwindle down. Something needs to take its place because people, communities, do want to have some asset that they can, you know, give to their children and kind of keep their value in. I mean, what, I, what I'm hearing is like it's it's the, the the accessibility, right? That's kind of the differentiator, right? And the fact that you have control over it, right? Like yields could yields in DeFi could approach yields of treasuries, but again, the accessibility of that is very different. Again, you can have a gold-backed stablecoin, but at the end of the day, gold is still sitting in some vault that's controlled by some bank, and you know I don't have control over that. Um, and again, so like people will naturally opt into that system that aligns with their own incentives that they have full control over and I'll drive adoption. So I, I think we have probably two or three minutes left. Maybe um, everyone cares about, you know, forecasts and outlook. What's, what's our kind of, you know, end of year and into next year forecast uh, briefly? It doesn't have to be priced, but just kind of what it, what, what's, where are we at, where are we going? Maybe I'll start. Um, <laughs> so there's some, there's some seasonality for a year-end rally, and, and there is a lot of cash on the sideline. So I'm going to stick my head out there and say, you know, be a bit positive on this one. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I think the space is lacking a narrative. So, you know, we, we had the crash and then we had the ETH merge narrative. And everyone got really excited and, you know, ETH price went up. The problem with uh, vault traders right now is we, we don't see any narrative for the next year until the Bitcoin halving in 24, right? So we're sort of looking for a narrative. Um, I'm going to be positive on this seasonality year end, but I think by and large, the next year might be a bit flattish kind of trading right. uh, with some upside, uh, moderate upside. All right. I think Zahir, you said the right tail is most underpriced versus the left tail. What do you... Uh... Right. Yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> so I, I think the overall take for me has been that, that the right tails are mispriced compared to the left tail. So um, whenever you have a perpetual stream of just negative news, let's just say for the last nine months, um, it's really hard to constantly one up that negative stream, right? So it's like... You had Russia invasion, you have like, uh, you know, energy crisis, you have um, Europe getting really cold over the, uh, over, during the winter. Um, and then you also have bad CPI prints, you have sticky core, you have, and, and so on and so forth. And, and to some point, it just stops becoming that. Um, so I think um, as the markets are constantly getting into both, like global markets in terms of positioning for, for uh, shorts overall, um, and then also in crypto, you have like record high skews um, over, you know, three, six months uh, for, for tenors. I think it's hard to imagine that there's going to be this perpetual stream of negative news um, and a constant stream of deterioration. So the right tails are definitely mispriced, in my opinion. Um, I think maybe Jordi could agree on this, too, uh, as, as, maybe, as not the, the bull on the stage. But um, even between crypto and TradFi, I think we have a much more compelling case to imagine why crypto has probably bottomed and why you know uh, traditional markets may be uncertain. Um, and a lot of this has to do with how much front-loading of that 
uh, carnage that we've had that we spoke about a little bit earlier. Um, so going into year end, I'm fairly optimistic. I think positioning um, should also still be cautious, generally speaking. Um, but I think um, you're getting to the tail end of this of this really peak bearishness and peak hawkishness. And I think uh, I'm generally a believer of when you know when the masses are very focused on one concept, say inflation or interest rates or Federal Reserve, this has probably been the highest, you know, saturation of these words globally um, ever, right? You know, five years ago, nobody cared about watching an FOMC meeting, right? Um, and now it's like, you know, we watch it like we go to a pub and you're going to watch Jerome Powell speak. So um, I think when you get to that extent of extremity, then, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to misplace the, the, the left tails. I'm going to be concerned if we have right. a bullish consensus here. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> All right. So Jordy's on stage. I mean, I'm going to be a bit cliche. Any final comments, Jordy? Huh? Is any final comments, Jordy? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll end it with a cliche. You know, short-term cautious, long-term very bullish, certain things. Um, I'll just quickly explain. Short-term, I think, you know, on the Fed, they will keep pushing until they break stuff. We're very close to stuff breaking. I can kind of sense it. Like, stuff is going to break very soon. We're seeing it with the volatility in currencies and treasuries. So I'm not necessarily like extremely bullish right now. Um, I think like the next few months, we'll see some crazy stuff, crazy headlines like we've seen recently with the pound. So I'm very cautious. Longer term, I think the thing that makes me extremely bullish for things like Bitcoin in ETH, for example, where you have a limited supply, you have kind of a generation that is more and more interested in these assets, they're going to be very scarce. And what people are not looking at, I agree, is the right tail, but in the sense of the in, uh, in elasticity, where nobody will want to sell their ETH and their Bitcoin in certain situations. And if somebody's going to want to buy a Bitcoin in five years, there may not be many of them left that are willing to sell. And that means we could get explosive prices. Right. So I am very long-term bullish despite the current macro environment. Yeah, a low, a low free float cuts both ways. So we've seen the downside over the last <laughs> nine months. Hopefully the next you know, 12 to 24, we see the other side of that. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.